Friends, the temptations of Jesus, we hear in all three synoptic gospels. This year, beginning in the year C, the gospel of Luke, we once again hear about the three temptations of Jesus. Several important questions are raised by this gospel passage. What is Jesus going to the desert for 40 days? What is the significance of 40 days? What did it mean to the Jewish community of the first century? Second, why does the devil encounter Jesus in the desert and tempt him with these three temptations? What is the significance of these three temptations? The significance of bread turning into stone, we turn into bread, showing him the kingdom of the world, the significance of jumping down from the mountain top, what is the nature of these temptations? Notice the role of the scriptures. The scriptures play in these temptations. Whenever the devil puts Jesus to the test, Jesus does not argue with them or debate with them. What does Jesus do? His reference point is the scripture. He quotes the scripture to respond to the devil. And the devil does the same as well. You will see that out of all the temptations, devil's response is the longest. Luke wants us to draw attention to the quote that the devil makes, which is Psalm 91, the Psalm is in the Old Testament for exhaustion for healing those possessed. One of the four Psalms that they wrote. And finally, why does the church use this passage always on the first Sunday of the night? We'll see how much we can get from there. So in the Old Testament, the number 40 has the symbolic value for the period of purification, period of testing, and period of preparation. Think about the first account of 40 days in Genesis chapter 7 and 8. The floods and Noah's ark and Noah waiting for the floods and water to receive so we can go in go on the ground and so live a normal life. So purification of a new creation that is to be formed. Testing to know his faith in God during these situations will he remain faithful. Noah's faith in God and Finally, the preparation of this new generation that is being formed because others disagree with God and God wants to recreate. So purification, testing, preparation. Sounds to me, the RCA candidates in the whole church is called to the word these three important things of the season of Lent days. It's that you we all think. Same thing is true of the Exodus. Not just 40 days, but 40 years. 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert, preparing themselves. The Israelites in Egypt and in the desert, they were not meant to remain in the desert. It's a time of purification for this people that were unfaithful to God. It's the time of testing. Will they really trust God despite the hunger, the thirst, the attack of the enemies, the attack of the snakes? Or are they going to revert back to idolatry? It's time of testing in the desert. They're not supposed to remain there. They're preparing to go to where they come to, like the first reading we talked about, the land of milk and honey, 
But if they go together, they will. If they purify themselves, if they make the test or pass the test, and finally, if they prepare themselves in the right way, the same way Jesus, in a sense here, is embodying the people of Israel in himself. He's inaugurating a new exodus by recapitulating what happened in the first Exodus. Like Israelites is going to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus himself does not really have to be purified of sin, but he has become one of us, one like us, became man and so on behalf of humanity. For example, the soul perhaps in the different children. He's going to battle with the Satan, with the devil, who led human beings to sin in the beginning of creation, the book of Genesis that he referred to. Jesus is also going to be tested by the temptations of the devil. And finally, as a preparation for his public ministry, because if you read the Gospel of Luke, soon after this chapter of these verses, Jesus is going to come out in public and begin his public ministry of teaching, preaching, healing. So, before that, he has to pass the test of obedience to the Father. He has to prove himself obedient through purification, testing, and preparation. Then, he will begin his public ministry. So, why these three temptations? These three temptations of Jesus in Luke's Gospel parallel the three reasons for the fall of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. Why did they fall? Were they stupid? Were they foolish? Many asked, right? Well, they were not stupid. They were not foolish. They were free. They were free. That is why the fall. Three reasons for the fall. To read the book of Genesis, since the chapter, the tree was good for food. First, second, delight to the heart. Third, desirable to make one wise. So he took the fruit, ate the fruit, gave it to us. So these three things, three reasons for the fall are summarized in the New Testament in the letters of St. John as lust of the flesh of the eyes and of pride, disordered desires of pleasure, possession, and pride. I know there are many things today. Pleasure, possession, and pride coming from lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride. They want to do things in a bad way, terribly. They keep God out of what they want. You know, food is good. You know, possessions are good. The church has a lot of properties, right, around the world. To build this kingdom, to preach the good news, right? And pride, in a sense, that we don't take pride in and put someone else down, but being proud of our faith, for example, in a virtuous way, pride is good as well. They want good things, but they break the commandment and they fall. Luke's Gospel highlights a parable in Genesis with these three temptations and the three reasons for the fall. Pleasure, possession, pride, lust of the flesh, eyes, and pride will come to them in the same. So God tests us to grow in virtue. The devil tempts us to fall into sin. You know, we have professors, some of them wanted really to test us so that, you know, they would get the best of us and we would excel. Others tested us, they wanted our faith, right? There was some, I'm not sure if you had those encounters of certain professors. 
So, also, you know, God tests us to grow in virtue, the devil tempts us to fall into sin. How do we respond to the test? Both are trials, both are hearts, realities. How do we respond? So these three temptations may be captured. He capitulates the three sins of Adam to show that now he is overcome with them. So you see the devil tempting Jesus first, the lust of the flesh, the food is good, but lust of the flesh, food, pleasure, sensual, sensual lust isn't, is, is sinful. So the devil tempts Jesus with the lust of the flesh by showing him, by asking him to turn the stone into bread and Jesus responds to that. Secondly, the devil tempts him with the lust of the eyes, telling him, this home taken, I will give to you, if you only take a knee. Jesus does not fall to the lust of the eyes. And finally, the lust of pride. If you are the son of God, you will jump down. And the devil quotes Psalm 91, that we read a portion of it that we chanted this morning. Look at Psalm 91 when you go on and read it again. It's very powerful song. Just does not give it to that either. The same words of Satan, devil, are echoed when Jesus made to the cross by his execution of saying, If you are the Son of God, come down, save yourself and save us as well. See the correlation of this as well. So, all these three temptations, Jesus responds with the scriptures as a reference point. How do we respond to these temptations? We start the season of Lent where the church and the gospel of Matthew Greek and always asks us to fast, to pray, to give alms. When challenged with the excuse me, with the lust of the flesh, let us confront it by modifying modifying it, putting the desires of the flesh voluntarily through fast. Let's fast more than what we have done in the past. And detach ourselves from sensual pleasures or pleasures of food that, that, that keep us away from the godly ways. Secondly, the loss of the eyes. Possessions. Give it away, be detached, do charity, do alms, as the scripture says, right? That's the way we address that second part. And finally, so this way also be detached and build the virtue of detachment. And finally, prayer helps us build the virtue of humility. Are you prideful? You have the desire for self-love. These are these are your passions, all three. Pleasures, sensual pleasures, you know, lust of the lust of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride are all desire passions, are all three concupiscences that the church talks about. And it wants us to overcome these by the three disciplines of land. In prayer we grow in humility, we grow in God's grace, and through prayer we can really stay focused to meet our Lenten disciplines, to remain faithful to our Lenten promises. It is a test, let's remember. It is a time of purification, not only for our sin things, but for each one of us. It is a time of preparation for all of us. Preparation to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and our rising from all our falls after 40 days 
Then finally, our destiny of heaven as our goal, our eternal hope. Through these discourse, through these helps that the church gives us by being watchful against the lust of the flesh, the eyes, and pray, we will overcome this. So, as we talked about, on well, yes, let us stay, let us pray great, right? Let us pray great. Let's stay one of the three and pray real great. Really, it's going to help us. You know, the sign was given to me by a friend of mine in 2012 when I had to make a discernment whether to continue as a priest in religious life or to join the Dyson priest. And this sign has Reminded me all to that year how important it is. And it has become part of my life. And prayer is significant to all of us. So that's very great. And it's going to help us overcome all the challenges. And to purify ourselves, in tests, we will overcome. And we will be prepared to celebrate the day of the Son of the Holy Spirit.